introduce the chapters. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, all. I have the great privilege in introducing the session, session's chairperson, Dr. S. Namata Shivashankari, ma'am, Associate Professor, Department of English, Tripur Kumaran College for Women, Tripur. She has more than 15 years of experience in teaching, and as a research supervisor, she has produced seven anchor scholars and currently supervising five PhD and two anchor scholars. She has attended 34 seminars, conferences, and webinars and workshops altogether. She has published 17 papers in various reputed journals and also attended three in service training programs. She is also the member of the Board of Studies, UT and CG for Vellalar College for Women, Autonomous e -Road. She served as a question paper setter for Sri Ramakrishna College Autonomous Coimbatore and Parks College of Arts and Science, Tirupur. She served as a coordinator for department activities and currently serving as a member of organizing committee for the department. Ma'am, you can now proceed with the session. Thank you, Ms. Mirthala, for giving me, uh, uh, introducing me. So at this outset, uh, am I audible to you all? Yes, yes ma'am, ma you're audible. Okay. Okay, good morning, all of you. It's my pr uh, proud privilege to chat this session. I welcome all the elite intellectuals uh, to share their views uh, and ideas on this platform about the subaltern studies. And uh, first, I would like to uh, present uh, Ms. Kuma, Edith Milo. Edith Milo. Melody, okay, a second MA student from Don Bosco College to share her views on Dalit feminism in the poem Mother by Jyoti Langeva. Good afternoon, ma'am. Can you hear me, ma'am? Yeah, I'm audible. Yeah, I can hear you. You can present your paper, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, my screen is visible for you? Yeah, it, yeah. it, it is visible. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. So good afternoon, all, good afternoon to all one and again. And today I'm going to present on Dalit Feminism in the poem, Mother by Jyoti Lanjeshwa. We all know every human being has their own uniqueness. And uh, every human being's strength does not lie on their physique only. Uh, their strength also lies in their mind and their emotional intelligence and all and when people are born they were divided into different category that is what we know as class and class difference they started to experience the class difference by birth and when it comes to dalit they were known as untouchable in previous era they are uh, they are known as untouchable and they were called as low caste people in india they were subjugated to the hierarchy of society in society equality between men and women is always a question and we can find that more often in our indian culture and dalit especially suffer for their rights and they are stuck they are struggling to get all their belongings and what is meant for them dalit women every time su suffer by humiliation and sacrifice jyoti lanjeshwar is a marathi dalit feminist and this poem of mother, she picturized sacrifice and selflessness of a mother. She is a continuous follower of Dr. Ambedkar. We all know feminism is equality between men and women. It stands for the equality between men and women in all occasions and in all stages of life. When it comes to Dalit feminism, it focuses on caste, gender, and class difference in Dalit community. We all know that gender equity is a question in uh, no matter what time it is, what era it is, it is all it always been a question in our society. So Dalit female suffer more in the society, and this Dalit feminism focuses on caste, gender, and class difference. This paper aims to call out the struggle, humiliation, sacrifice, class difference, which has been faced 
by a mother who has been a depiction of a uh, Dalit woman in this poem. Family, when it comes to family, the, the poet Jyoti Lanjeshwar clearly explained how women suffers in our family and how she sacrifices ourselves to the development of our family. In the poem, we could find that the poet narrated as that mother never wear a gold sari or a gold necklace. We can find that all the high class people, high class women were made to wear gold saris and necklace. That is for them shows their class structure. This Dalit mother were worked out and she suffered hunger. Even though she suffered hunger, she never fails to feed a family and kids. In our society, we can find that the duty of feeding the family and taking care of the kids is the primary duty of male. But this, mal this Dalit mother was pushed to take care of the family and her kids as well. In the history of India, we can find that in previous days, women were not allowed to go out and work. But that case is very different when it comes to Dalit females. This Dalit mother kept her tears, which, which, which were of struggles and discrimination. She struggled to work hard and feed her family. But men pushed her to the end of her life. They, they, humiliated, they humiliated her and they harassed her. However, she fought back and stand for herself and continues to fight for herself and, and her family. When it comes to society, the Dalit mother doesn't alone care for the care for her family. She also care for her society. She protests against, along with Protestants, for the name of Untouchable. She wants to change the name of Untouchable, so she fought along with the other Protestants, which high which high class women were ne were never gonna do, because for them against a society and. For them, against against a society and against a family is against of modesty. When parents take care of their family, when they lost their son, they would feel that that is a sorrowful event of their life. But this mother in the poem felt proud because her son died by the gunshot of police when he protest against government for the for changing the name of untouchable so she considered him as martyr who fought for a noble cause and in her deathbed she advised to the younger generation that they should follow ambedkar and live in unity here the poet insists that they should follow ambedkar who fought for the equality of all the class and who stands against the class difference. Our final words in, in our deathbed is Jaibim, which shows a patriotism. No matter how she struggled in a uh, how she struggled in a family and in a society, she never leave a patriotism for the nation. Till the end of her life, she fought against class difference, caste, and for equity. So this paper aims to bring out the idea of idea that no matter who the person is, everyone needs an opportunity to expose themselves to the world. And I would like to conclude my paper with a quote of Frida Pinto, Pinto that gender equality is a human fight, not a female fight. So I'd like to call all the people as a researcher that Gender equality is not the fight of women alone. Everybody should fight for it and everybody should get the equal rights, no matter which cause they belong to, which society they belong to, they should have the equal opportunity. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, a very good presentation by Edith Melody. Can you all hear me, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so through your presentation, uh, 
the poet has beautifully portrayed the life of women especially of yes, those women who are coming from the backward that is from the territoria how they are uh, offering their whole of their life to their uh, society and to their family and also this uh, poem i think entirely represents women life is it not without leaving any aspects of the life so now there is a, it is a trend has not changed today also many dalit women are still living that cheaper life they are living a very cheaper life and trying to give the best for the development of the nation and uh, so is dalit people can be called as dalit women can be called as dually subordinated doubly oppressed sorry ma'am can you come again is dalit women can be called as dually subordinated people i think yes ma'am because yes. they are not only suffering in their community they are suffering uh, in all the community among all the community they are suffering the most so they can call this that okay they are first of all they are uh, called as uh, dalit and then because they are the women so and uh, they don't have any proper identity and uh, women she is a victim of patriarchal despotism and she is being exploited as dalit by the upper caste people am i right yes ma'am okay and a very good presentation thank you thank you ma'am edit and now yes, i call thank you ma'am okay and now i request rosario a student from don bosco college to present paper on the hardship of women as depicted in jane eyre by charlotte bronte and its interrelationship to the current world rosario are you here rosario can you able to hear me ma'am yeah yeah i can able to hear you you can present your views can share your paper yes ma'am yes ma'am can hardship of women as depicted in jane eyre by charlotte charlotte bronte and its interrelations to the current world the okay, case please Visible. You are not audible, Rosario. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me, Prima? Yeah, your presentation is also visible. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, dear. the topic i mean the paper the hardship of women as displaced in a dire era by charlotte bronte and its interrelation to the current world i just have tried to begin the novel yeah women in dire era there are many female characters excuse me sir what the Yeah. So your voice is not clear. Okay. Am I clear? And now we are clear. the woman uh, in victoria era but treated as a second class citizen the society they had a very few rights and relative control over their own life women were expected to marry have children but look after the home the during the victorian age uh, they don't they don't treated as a 
well man they have treated as a second class people only they did, uh, they didn't give respect they didn't treat uh, as a equal for a long time women depend on men only at present also some some more place women were depending on men only the novel acts as a reminder of this until a woman won the rights to what the things started to change from it herself was a governess like uh, chan but she eventually married another actress in the novel chan is not conversely beautiful as she described as became plain looking uh, in the during which they paid women were not not portrayed because they don't see they don't care they don't bother about from this novel jane from young age has a passion for knowledge and life but in the novel they don't uh, i mean encourage them encourage her to develop in her life and to gain knowledge and uh, to give the respect in her society then wants to be loved and find love she was uh, put into down they didn't know uh, bring up her in life which she does when she goes to work as a governor at the throne fill in the novel she always clings to her moral compass as she is a self righteous character even though then can be a passionate rebellion at the end of this novel this is joseph and jane finally marry and jane gets a fairy tale happy ever after in the novel she finds a character i mean roster i mean she attracts an her in him and gets and fall into love and marry him the importance of a female protagonist in this novel jane is a strong independent woman broad could not have chosen a male character to be main why did she choose as a cast female character the protagonist was a male for example roster was the main character the novel would not have been as elevated as it would be been a completely different novel we keep see in the novel the rich sister ella chooses to develop in the uh, novel as she finds herself uh, with the jane she compares herself and uh, puts herself to down and then miss temple at her lower jena looks up to miss temple as a mother fears because she was a kind teacher in the novel she cares of the chan and brings out his uh, fearless and uh, all the problems occurs in life just i would like to conclude uh, this paper this whole paper is uh, discussed with the feminism by chan era by charles brandy he is a english uh, well novel writer she portrays in own experience in life in this novel during victorian period uh, women's writing was uh, not widely published but bronet wrote the novel under the pen name roll bell thank you thank you mananda okay rosario yes ma'am thank you for your presentation and i would have a only a small question whether the victorian women have freedom on their own rights in the society no right. no ma'am No. at the time uh, there was no freedom they, they were no okay. okay okay 
uh, and i don't think so the victorian women are not expected to express their uh, own opinions outside the uh, limited areas yes limited areas yes, subject yes ma'am yes ma'am and uh, in particular with jane ayer uh, uh, so she is not been an identity figure in the novel yes ma'am after that only in the last uh, novel mm -hmm. she explains i mean she expresses uh, all the freedom it puts into okay. the victorian age period ma'am okay the whole book i think it contains of a social criticism with a strong sense of christian morality and its core yes ma'am yes ma'am okay and it is considered to be the head of the individual characters of how jane and how the novel approach approaches has been applied to the class topics even to the uh, sexuality religion and feminism during the victorian period yes ma'am yes ma'am everything okay. is it includes ma'am okay okay uh, thank you rosario and now we'll move on thank to you. the next person uh, now i call yes bishma joy a second ma student of from holy cross college to present her paper on agonizing traumas of the untouchables a critical study of vinodini's thrust uh, good afternoon ma'am Good, good afternoon, afternoon everyone mm. ma'am shall i start my presentation yeah you can start your presentation yes just a second ma'am is my screen visible yeah your screen is visible okay ma'am so good afternoon everyone myself is besma joy and i'm currently pursuing my second year of pg in english literature at holy cross college nagarkovil and the title of my paper is agonizing traumas of the untouchables a critical study of vinodini's thirst so what is life so it is full of surprises and one doesn't know the astronomy of the future so every day every one they battle with tenacious power why because of the sole purpose of attaining peace and love they hope for a miracle that would happen in their life and which would also enrich their life so at the end of the day some people they achieve their dreams while some other they are vacuumed by the black hole and the latter it is similar to the condition of the dalit community so they are not extraterrestrials but they are treated like one forgive forgiveness and tolerance Uh, these are the expected qualities of a dalit but in return they receive the reward of agony and annihilation and the eyes of the society they are always uh, filled with contempt and disgust towards the uh, low caste people and especially the dalit and this makes the dalit people to hate themselves and uh, to be frank even the dalit people everyone they have the will of fire Uh, even to burn their tormentors to death but they chose deliberately to love others and a life filled with bliss is unimaginable for a dalit and vinodini she is one of the optimistic dalit writers who portrayed the lucid pictures of injustice that was done to the dalit community by the high caste people and her play daham it captures the marginalization faced within the dalit community and this play it is a very famous play and it was translated from telugu to english under the title thirst by sunita rani and this paper it aims to unveil the oppression and suppression faced by the dalit community through this play thirst by vinodini so india india is a beautiful nation and it is known for its unity in diversity and in dalit community the people they are also called as harijans and untouchables and uh, what many personalities they uh, sacrifice their lives for the upliftment of dalit community but uh, uh, some of the known personalities are uh, mahatma gandhi and uh, dr b r ambedkar Uh, mahatma gandhi he wanted to eradicate untouchability 
from the Indian caste system. And so in an effort to do that, he uh, started the Harijan Sevak San in 1932. And then the father of the Indian constitution, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, he is also an eminent personality who fought against the abolition of untouchability. But even though after suffering, uh, after undergoing many changes and uh, many, many personalities who have sacrificed their lives for the upliftment of Dalit community, still uh, the Dalit people, they are suffering from the clutches of society and especially due to the high caste people. So the people belonging to the high caste, uh, they enjoy various pleasures, but the people belonging to the low caste they still suffer a lot. So oppression, it is a term which is equivalent to violence. It can be done in the basis of physical, emotional and psychological trauma. So people uh, who are belonging to the high class, they deliberately oppress the people belonging to the low caste. They silence the low caste people by oppressing them. And they even threaten to kill them when one uh, starts a revolution against their norms. So in this play too, the protagonist Dasu, uh, he belongs to the Dalit community and his family also, his family is also uh, treated with the authoritative attitude by the high caste people. His mother, Saurama, she is beaten and verbally abused by the high caste people uh, as she asked for a picture of water. See, water, it's a basic necessity of life. No one can say that uh, I own this water. Water belongs only to me. See, water is a basic necessity for survival. But uh, the Dalit people, they don't even get the basic necessity. And the high caste people, they strongly believe that the low caste people can, uh, can be controlled through suppression. So the act of suppressing is also evident in the play. See, when uh, Dasu, he comes to know about the injustice that uh, which was done to his mother, he gets furious and he wanted to voice out. But his grandfather, uh, Tata, he, he doesn't allow Dasu to do that because uh, the high caste people, they have suppressed uh, the low caste people. They have silenced them. The low caste people, they also face many issues in their daily life. Uh, they struggle to earn their daily bread. They are not treated equally and they don't even get justice. They, uh, but even in spite of all these, uh, they tolerate and suppress their emotion uh, and learn to live with it. So this injustice, which was done to the low caste uh, uh, people is also evident in the play, The Thirst. And uh, when Saurama, uh, she revolted against the high caste people to get water. Uh, she was given the penalty to walk naked around the village by shaving her head or she was asked to pay a fine of rupees 10,000. So uh, while the, the sinners were only the high caste people, they started the argument. But uh, the sinners, they are not punished. But only the victim, Saurama, she is punished. punished. And even too, it's an in, injustice done to the uh, Dalit people. And Dalit people, uh, they cannot even protest against this injustice. Uh, they have suppressed their emotion and they have also learned to uh, get used to this kind of injustice. So justice, it was only done uh, to the high caste people, but not to the low caste people. Uh, the Dalit people and the lower caste people on the whole, they were not permitted to enter the uh, temple. They were not allowed to wear shoes and they were not even treated as human beings. And uh, liberation, talking about liberation, liberation is essential for every human being because it is the source of mental peace. And only through liberation, one could get a peace of mind and it also uh, makes a person physically calm. So people, they usually search for uh, freedom out uh, from the out frame of life but it is not like that freedom exists within each and every person so an individual can make a revolution only through new revelations and liberation
and in the play too, the liberation of the Dalit community commences from the roots of Dasu. Finally, in the play, Dasu, he voices out against the high caste people and gets his justice. So the present generation, uh, they usually follow the present generation of the high caste uh, uh, society. They follow their ancestors. They follow the customs which were uh, devised by their ancestors. So the high caste people, they deliberately use the name of their ancestors as an excuse to torment the low caste people. So the present generation, they only they have the ability to change this senseless rules which was devised by their ancestors. And they have a chance. They only have a chance to liberate the low caste people. So they should not treat the low caste people like their ancestors or their parents. But instead, they have to transform themselves and they have to respect the low caste people. Uh, they should first consider these low caste people as a mere human being and then they have to help them during their sufferings. So like Dasu, the low caste people, when they are exposed to injustice, they have to revolt and they have to fight for their needs. But at the same time, uh, this can be prevented if the low, uh, if the present generation of the high caste society, if they devise or transform their rules, uh, uh, while they are transforming the rules and treating the low caste people with uh, respect and also by helping them, both the parties, that is the high caste people as well as the low caste people, they can lead a peaceful and happy life. So both of them will be having equality and happiness in their life so uh, thank you everyone for listening patiently to my presentation okay, Vinodini, uh, thank you Vinodini, ma'am besma joy am the okay, play sorry, which... sorry. <laughs> yeah yes ma'am okay thank you for your presentation thank and, you uh, uh, is the author trying to say Vinodini, uh, writer Vinodini takes pain to demonstrate the method and the perpetrator and then agenda that differs. That is, yes. you know, uh, the writer, I think the writer has depicted the internalization of the caste discrimination, class consciousness, right? Yes, by the yes. first generation people. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So the whole session has been uh, uh, speaking only about the Dalit literature. <laughs> very good. Yes, Okay, it is all class consciousness raising. So yes. that nowadays it has become, uh, re, uh, Dalit literature has become uh, emerged as a new field in the study. Yes, ma'am. In India. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. And okay. thank you, everyone. Okay. And the next one is uh, Nega Mandotra, a research scholar from USHS. Yes, yes, Guru Gobind Singh, Indra Prasad University, Dwaraka. And he is going to present the paper on the topic, Humiliation, a recurrent issue in select plays by Indian women playwrights. Nega Mandotra. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the, the introduction. So uh, I'm here to present my topic, Humiliation, a recurrent issue in select plays by Indian women playwrights. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that unlike my fellow presenters, I would not be presenting a Microsoft PowerPoint presentation. Rather, I'll be reading the short write-up that I have prepared for the presentation. With this, I would like to introduce my topic. The first part of the paper is introduction itself. And it begins like, Women Hindu mythology are always subjected to humiliation at the hands of men. It is through patriarchy that men assert their dominance through power play and victimization of women. The Mahabharata and Ramayana present us with multiple narratives wherein women are represented as passive beings subjected to oppression and marginalization. Therefore, the paper aims to investigate humiliation, a recurrent issue addressed by Indian women playwrights such as C.S. Lakshmi, Ambai, 
Arsu Mangai and Varsha Adalda in their respective plays like Crossing the River, Frozen Fire, and Mandubai. Drawing from Hindu mythology, Ambai, Mangai, and Adalja have consciously selected the myth of women, the myth of Amba Shikhandi, and the myth of Mandodri, respectively, to address their trauma, pain that they have experienced through humiliation at the hands of men. The conscious use of myth to retell and recreate these mythical women characters in contemporary times demands the investigation or to highlight the necessity of mythopoetic exploration of women in mythology. The second part of the paper introduces uh, uh, my choice of selection of Indian women playwrights. So why I have uh, selected Indian women playwrights? Many playwrights focus their attention on presenting women's issues on stage to generate awareness while creating a ripple effect of change and presenting resistance as a meaningful way of proclaiming women's rights. To become successful in their journey, they chose to use mythology with a focus on mythical women characters and presented their plight to the audience. The idea behind choosing mythical women characters may have been to serve the position of women in society. Women like Amba, Mandudri, and Sita are silent characters in Hindu mythological texts with little or no agency to express themselves. This is where women playwrights open the window of opportunity with mythical women characters with voice that echoes on the stage and lingers on the page until the last word. With such a notion, women playwrights aim to redefine the role of women by revisiting the mythology and recontextualizing it to create a space for women in Indian drama and society. This further ensures the place of women in Indian society as intelligent beings who are capable of voicing their opinions, expressing their pain, fears, love, and proclaiming their rights whenever necessary. The focus on women playwrights on mythical women characters from Hindu mythology brings in a range of questions and observations, inviting a new approach to studying myths and mythology. Ben Amos, in his article, Folk Tales states uh, that myths are associated with, uh, quote and unquote, supernatural beings exist beyond the boundaries of human time and are believed to be true. Nevertheless, despite their fictional nature, myths have a significant hold on human life, which is visible in Indian society as well as in Indian drama. Mandudri, Sita, and Amba are perceived as more than mythical characters. Their impact on human life resulted in a set of parameters that define women based on vices and virtues. For instance, Sita and Shrupnakha became the embodiment of good and bad women, considering their choices and actions. Sita, on one hand, represents a loyal and chaste woman, whereas Shilpnakha signifies lust, making her rebellious. Similarly, Mandodri, Dropti, Amba, etc., are associated with certain adjectives, placing them in particular frame of reference. The bifurcation of women into binaries such as chaste and impure, obedient and rebellious, silent and loud, etc., demands an investigation of myth through revisitation recontextualization, re rewriting, and rereading. Thus, women playwrights revisiting Hindu mythology are raising questions concerning women and their agency with the hope to create a space for women outside the domestic sphere. Coming to the third and final part of the presentation, which is titled Humiliation as a Foundation of Mythopoetic Exploration. To begin with, it is essential to understand the concept of humiliation. Typically, humiliation is regarded as an unwelcome assault on human dignity. To be humiliated is to be deliberately and destructively made inferior or lacking in some way by others. As a result, it is a deeply upsetting experience. It is difficult to overcome, and those who must deal with it on a daily basis feel a constant threat to their sense of self-worth. There are many definitions addressing the various parameters of humiliation. However, Sanjay Palshikar's definition of humiliation is apt to establish a re relationship between humiliation and power play. In his article, Understanding Humiliation, Palshikar defines humiliation as, quote unquote, a critical point, a power relationship, the cusp region, as it were, something that brings sharpness to the exercise of power and helps reproduce those powers of relations of power but it is also a potentially disruptive element of power that can have corrosive effects for the underlying normative order. If humiliation is a claim, it is made complete only by incorporating in it uh, in the proposed response 
the alleged humiliation than those who are making that claim must face a situation of choice and attain the clarity required for making that choice. It is then that humiliation becomes more than a language used to make a sense of disagreeable situ situation. In this sense, Ambai Sita, Mangesh, Ambashi Khandi, and Adalja's Mandudri find their voice in reliving their humiliation by raising questions that address their identity marginalized operation and passive existence. These mythical women characters challenge their position as subalterns by remembering their humiliation. From misrecognition or non recognition to recognition, their humiliation also raises the question of political, social, and cultural injustice as key elements contributing to, to their oppression and marginalization. <clears throat> as Sita in Crossing the River says, quote unquote, I am the Sita that authority creates. I am the Sita that faith creates. I am Sita the pawn. I am Sita the cheated. I am the oppressed Sita. Sita's creation in Ram's kingdom was a result of Ram's political ambition as a king, who's meant to fulfill the demands of the public crowd, uh, of public, a crowd consisting of men and did their desire to test Sita's purity during mythological times. Reduced to a marginalized being, Sita, once a queen, finds, finds recognition as a woman with a voice in Amba's place. Similarly, Amba, abducted and humiliated by Gish to satisfy his ego, now finds a space to address and recognize her hatred towards Gish in Mangai's frozen fire. She says, quote, until now, a fire burns within me. Until now, until this moment when Gish was laid low, my eyes carried in them an unblinking hatred. Like Ambai and Mangai, Adalja also addresses the humiliation of Mandodri, as Mandodri says, quote, unquote, here, woman is an object of pleasure, a mere plaything to be used like a piece of linen that can be thrown away when it is soiled. All women have experienced pain and suffering, but only men are recognized for their sacrifice, pain, and suffering. However, Ambai, Mangai, and Adalja try to address the pain and suffering of these mythical women characters, as Mandodri says, quote unquote, to read a woman's heart, one has to be a woman, perhaps. Thus, the Indian women playwrights attempt to renegotiate the position of women in Indian society as expressive and assertive individuals rather than subalterns. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Nega Mandotra. And I would like you like to ask you a question: Whether is humiliation the strong is the strongest emotion of all? Is it audible? Uh, yes, ma'am. Ma'am, mm. uh, in my opinion, I think humiliation is a uh, strongest, uh, you know, um, emotion uh, felt can trigger you to make certain choices that you may not even think about. Okay, it may, it, may, uh, it can lead you to take action. It can lead you uh, in a position of power. The only, uh, I think the only uh, thing that matters is that one has to accept that humiliation and then move forward. Okay. So in that way, the humiliation is a form of a trauma. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So very good presentation. And another one question for me. And uh, so why you're very uh, particular about Hindu myth, is there not any humiliation? Ma'am, there, there is. I'm not denying humiliation in other mythology. It's just oh. that uh, these, uh, you know, the uh, narratives, the plays that I have taken, they are focused on Hindu mythology. So mm -hmm. that my focus is uh, revolving around Hindu mythology. Had I taken humiliation, at, uh, you know, uh, from multiple perspectives and in multiple mythologies, then I would have uh, in, uh, included other mythologies. Okay, okay, not that, but. I'm asking whether is there any humiliations in connection with the Western mythology? Is there any connection for the humiliation in the Western mythology? Uh, yes, we can refer. Is it not? Yes, ma'am. We can refer. Okay. Myth of Mithya. Okay. For example, Helen of Troy. So yes, okay. we can make connections. Okay. 
Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for your wonderful presentation, Nega Malhotra. Mm -hmm. And the last uh, presenter of this technical session is Lisa Pavitran. Lisa Pavitran, Assistant Professor, Department of English from KSMBB College, Shastama Kota, Kollam, from Kerala. Yes, ma'am. This topic is audible. Am I audible? Dalit, yes, yes. Dalit women consciousness in the select poems of Vigila Chirappar. Chirappar. We can proceed, Lisa uh, Pavitran. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Topic for my presentation is a Dalit Women Consciousness in the Selected Forms of Vigila Chirappal. Dalit women have struggled for centuries against caste based exploitation and such different forms of hierarchies. And the neglected voices of Malayali Dalit writers have now received accolades from the literary spheres across India and also in Academy of Dalit Literary Studies. We find only a handful of Malayali Dalit women writers, and Vijila Chirappad is one among them. Her poems are manifestations of Dalit consciousness, which reveal discriminations and disparities meted out to the lower caste, especially uh, women, by the ideologies upheld by the dominant caste. The revolutionary zeal of her poems drew the attention of a large number of readers and instilled in them a sense of guilt and justice. This paper examines how the Dalit woman consciousness is effectively manifested in her selected forms. Born in Calicut, Kerala, Chirapat's forms speak of the experience of living life as a Dalit woman, how intersectionality of gender and caste shapes the lives of these women in Kerala. She maintains that the struggle of every woman is not the same, where she distinguishes between the dominant caste women and Dalit women. Her poems reflects everyday difficulties that the Dalit women face in and out of their homes. Her poems have emerged successful in developing a specifically female framework, and they deal with female realities such as menstruation, marriage, cooking, relationship between daughter and mother, between sisters, etc. We find a sincere approach to the realities of everyday life. Uh, for my presentation, I have selected eight of her poems and which effectively portrays the Dalit woman consciousness. In the poem, Amma Uru Kalpanika Kavita Allah, to be translated as, Mother is not a poetic pigment of our imagination. Here the mother figure depicts the harsh realities of Dalit life. She is blabbering about the miseries of her life. In her complaining voice, one can hear the problems the lower class suffers. Even if they have a piece of land and a roof over their heads, they might not be having electricity or water at home. The uneducated mother's voice becomes a criticism of the society. When she is ready to go out to earn her livelihood, she asks her daughter to switch off the radio because it's all in Sanskrit, which is a matter of concern only for the upper class. In another poem, entitled uh, Urambuk, to be translated as Wasteland. Uh, Dalit woman named Chandrika tells about the houses where she can enter only through back doors. The poet expresses her bitterness when she bemoans the plight of this woman. She, a human being, and the fish from the market have the same entrance to a house. Ironically, Chandrika entered the house listening to the Indian pledge, all Indians are my brothers and sisters. In another poem, Mumbai Parangaval, uh, to be translated as She Who Flew a Four, the plight of servitude of a mother is picturized who works hard for her kids and family. They are different from the mothers portrayed on big screen who are presented in silk saris and ornaments. Vijila says that the mothers she knew are mothers who face the bitter realities of life. I quote, in our home, there is no TV, no fridge, neither mixer, no grinder, no LPG, not even an iron box. 
it. My mother knew how to operate these much before I did, unquote, because she worked as maid in wealthy households. In one another poem, Uru Penpatiude Atmatada, an autobiography of a bitch, the poet draws the pathetic condition of the Dalit women who are presented as the shabby and hungry bitches sniffing and spited chewing gums in the heap of rubbish. People come running to catch hold of her male children and to drag away the female ones. They are neither powerful enough to bark at the strangers coming to their home, nor are they beautiful enough to decorate their houses. Above all, they have no milk, no flesh, not even a smooth skin to be bargained at their markets. The poem ends with a note of pain. I quote, O oh world, O oh world, our race is destined to hide in the backyards, to stare at the heap of waste, to curl and satisfy with the darkness, unquote. Vidila's native place, Perambra, influenced her a lot in her writing. Most of the characters in her poem emerge from this place. This intimacy with the people of her place can be seen in the poem, Aravet Chulla Mandi, to be translated as the bus at 6.30. In the bus at 6.30, there are people like the mason, means uh, the carpenter, Kuttapan, a woman with her vegetable basket for the market, a fisherwoman called Mariama, a sweeper named Vasandi, etc. The, there are passengers, these are passengers as black as crows and men in dirty shirts who set out to earn their daily bread. The poet presents the passengers as dirty working class people to highlight the condition of life even to date. Another poem, Kaigala uh, Tunigal, The Household Rags, strongly describes the protest of the writer against the social as well as the gender discriminations. The dirty kitchen rags symbolizes the Dalit themselves. They have become hard like rocks because of the dirt. Nobody washed them once. The poem ends with a hopeful note. The woman is pushed into the rain. The rain here stands as a rejuvenating and cleansing agent, which will release them from all the bondages. Next poem, Duram, to be translated as the distance, portrays the distance between the developing society and the stagnant condition of the Dalit. The daughter who wants to follow some beauty tips to sustain her youth is stricken with the grief Seeing her old mother preparing a meal with the cheap rice and vegetables she got from her courtyard. The children are playing outside without the amusement and jollity of toys. The stark realities of Dalit life are unveiled here. The last poem, The Vanity of Upper Class, is in the last poem, The Vanity of Upper Class is blatantly portrayed uh, in the poem Chotu Patram to be translated as the lunchbox. The virtues of caring and sharing are always associated with the people of the lower strata. Uh, that is what the poet says. Their life is simple and closely related to nature, whereas the upper class is characterized by artificiality and show off. The simple ones share their food with each other and praise their mother's skilled hands. But the upper class neither share their food nor, nor even wash their lunch boxes. They don't have the goodness to praise their mother's too. To conclude, Vidila Chirapat's poems uphold the fact that even a household rag can become the manifesto of the new world. The women writers create a world of their own because they are dissatisfied with the present world. In Vidila's own words, her poems are not mere lamentations of the plight of Dalit, but it is to wake them up to their present situation. She finds peace and identity in her homeland, in its smell and in the water of its smell. Vidila says that, the Kerala society has witnessed a lot of revolutions against casteism for the upliftment of Dalit, especially Dalit women. But Vijila still believes that casteism has still its roots in our minds. One cannot cast it away from the subconscious realm of their minds. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Lisa Pavitran. So all is all the poems are of autobiography in nature pardon man is all the poem of uh, the writer is a autobiographical work yeah mostly most, most of probably poems. yes most probably all the poems are autobiographical yes because she has first hand experience of Dalit life because she herself belongs to the community okay okay thank you for your presentation because the, uh, most probably the whole session as we have been discussing only about the Dalit studies, which has become a new field of research in India and which uh, looks at the problems of marginalized group of uh, groups.
particularly dalit people and tribals religious minority people so probably from women from excluded groups or denotified tribes physically challenged and similar groups in economical status and also in social and also in political spheres and uh, so there are so many uh, i think uh, so many uh, dalit studies uh, dalit studies scholars are coming up uh, for the research work on the nature and the forms of discrimination and social exclusion especially faced by the marginalized group and uh, so dalit uh, so the research on dalit studies have become a more uh, regeneration for the field of research for the young uh, researchers and uh, to this uh, at this in uh, outset so dalit studies as far as the subaltern studies um, it concentrates probably on the dalit studies and there are so many uh, research has been taken place in order to taking place in order to develop an understanding of the consequence of the social exclusion and discriminations on economic growth and poverty education health political participation and on well being of the marginalized social groups so one thing that what we can do is to educate the people of the minority communities so that's the only thing we can make the dalit or the minority people or the uh, the marginalized group to get aware of themselves and come forward for their well being and that's it and i would like to conclude by uh, conclude the session by stating this so all the uh, paper presenters have worked well for the dalit studies and they all all of us have come with a uh, one single idea and one single point that we have to educate the marginalized people in order to come up in their uh, life in order to separate the discriminations particularly the exclusion and discrimination induced deprivations and its consequences and uh, the even the i think the government has uh, uh, supported to uh, the policy making bodies for the inclusive policies also and there are a lot of funding agencies are also coming uh, forward to enable and to educate the marginalized people thank you thank you narmata ma'am thank you ma'am you have given shared the wonderful ideas uh, with the participants presenters thank you so much ma'am thank you so much for your uh, for spending your valuable time and uh, thank you dr mahalakshmi madam and it's my i place my warm gratitude to dr mahalakshmi the head of uh, avp college and also the cape comorin trust for giving this opportunity and uh, in this forum i would like to thank you uh, thank everyone for pa patiently listening and attending this uh, technical session thank you one and all thank you ma'am thank you so much ma'am thank you okay may i take leave ma'am yes ma'am yes ma'am yes. okay thank you hello ma'am uh, and yes yes ma'am Um, and one thing i wanted to share with you people i just forgot it that is uh, in order to up bring our the dalit people that everyone in the society should think of the sustainability of women and revolt against the society for the uh, discrimination that is a point i just wanted to uh, share yes, in initial itself but, but i have just forgot and just now i remember so we have yes ma'am of course very good point a wonderful point okay Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.